two kind of really have two major projects. Um, so we have a, a Pico, Pico satellite called TFT Cube, uh, and the one I'm talking about today, which is Gaze, which is our robotic observatory. Um, and there's a couple of other projects that we are sort of dabbling with, but we really don't have that much time to work on this. It's kind of like a hobby, hobby amateur space kind of level. Um, so this is a brief bit about the Pico satellite, really. Um, it's five centimeter cube spacecraft, um, hopefully launching sometime in the early 2020s. It's all open source, we kind of want to contribute to like, the amateur open source um, space initiatives that are going on at the moment. Things like the Uber Space Foundation, um, really big inspirations for this project. Um, and we kind of want to lean into the outreach aspects and there's we're looking at running a student competition for uh, designing a payload in the near future. Um, so hopefully that will be starting up this year. Um, but really the point of this talk is, is GAZE, which is our observatory project. Um, so this is basically the project to build a accessible, um, online accessible um, robotic telescope. Um, and at the moment we have two telescopes with largely different specialities. Um, one of which is capable of pictures like Mars here. Um, this isn't one of my photos, unfortunately, but it's, uh, it's taken with the exact same specifications. Um, the idea is to build this into looking for ways of doing citizen science and photometry. Um, lots of this is actually quite accessible for amateur space and amateur astronomy. Um, people don't really realize it. People think about the big meter, meter sort of scale telescopes that you see in actual observatories, but really you can do a lot of useful science, um, useful citizen science with much smaller scale hardware. Um, so the first telescope we've got is, is we call it Cecilia. Um, it's a six inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, the one and a half meter focal length means that it's really, really good for planetary um, or really bright solar system bodies. You get a lot of magnification. Unfortunately, it's terrible for anything else. Um, the reason for that is the F10 focal ratio. It means it's actually really, really slow. And basically what that means is if you compare that to a more common imaging setup, which is F5, that double ratio means it's actually four times the amount of integration time needed to take like an equivalent picture uh, with this telescope. Um, at the moment, we're not really using it. Um, we don't have enough cameras to put on all of the telescopes at the moment. So this one's kind of sitting literally in the kitchen at the moment. Um, but the idea is to use it as a kind of like a live observing telescope that you can pan around and look at different planetary objects um, with pretty quick imaging. Uh, this is the second telescope. This is our main one. We call this one Eleanor. Uh, it's an eight inch Newtonian telescope and has a one meter focal length. So it doesn't quite magnify as much, but it's much, much quicker to take its pictures. Um, it's got a much larger aperture. So it, it um, concentrates the light a little bit more and takes faster, faster images. Um, so this one is really, really good for imaging deep space objects. And the reason for that, if you look at the different mounts, so this one has what's called an altitude azimuth mount, which basically means it can point left, right, up and down. But this one has a, what's called an equatorial mount. And what that means is we align it to one of the celestial poles and effectively the mount rotates around with the sky. And what that means is we can take really, really long exposures um, as the, the, the sky doesn't rotate in the field of view. Um, so this makes this fantastic for sort of five to 10 minute exposures on really faint galaxies and nebula and things like that. Uh, this telescope actually got first light a couple of weeks, weeks ago. Um, we had the Newtonian delivered in like February um, and we, we just about got it all running. Um, so at the moment, uh, it's got a one shot color camera. So it's just running a, a camera DSLR. Um, it's, we're looking at getting a light pollution filter. So we, we shoot from the middle of Digcot, which isn't fantastic. Um, it's not bad, but we can get a lot of that light pollution out with a clip-in filter. So we're getting one of those this month. Um, auto guiding is really important. So that little telescope on top of the big telescope, that red puck kind of thing is a smaller camera. And what that does is track a star in the field of view and that lets us kind of lock on to the sky and kind of track. Um, and and that, that, that lets us do really, really, really long exposures with high accuracy. So you don't get any kind of star trailing or anything like that. Um, the, we also have complete autonomous running. So if that there's a PC strapped to the tripod leg and that lets us run it um, entirely autonomously. So we can basically tell it what object to focus on, what type of images we want to run, how many, any filters we want to use and it will kind of manage itself. Um, the idea is to take this, which will do basic astrophotography and kind of develop it into a capability to do full citizen science. Um, so the first step is to go into narrowband astrophotography, which is where you use really specialized filters to look at specific spectrum. 
Um, and then we transit that into looking at exoplanet transit photometry, which is kind of looking at the, the dip in the star brightness to detect exoplanets and potentially even uh, basic spectrometry, um, which we can do with a telescope of this size. Um, the idea is to, to get to this point, we'd be built in things like autofocusing, um, better ways of routing all the power and the data coming off the cameras. Uh, and the idea is to get to that point to do a, um, a mono camera with lots of different filters in, which makes it really useful for being able to do this narrow band photography. Um, so a bit about the spectrometry, well, this is not something you really associate with being able to, to do at an amateur scale, but um, what, we really, what we found is we got a second-hand medical spectrometer and we're gonna try and splice it into the, the optical path and hopefully we can be able to measure something if we can calibrate it properly. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind that. The spectrometry is a bit of a long shot, but the rest of it is actually quite well demonstrated. Um, so before I show you any of the actual pictures we've got, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we get there. So we have what's called light frames, which is the actual frames that have our data in. So these are the main ones we take during, during observation. Um, they have all of the, the pretty picture in, but unfortunately they're contaminated with lots of different noise, lots of different distortions. And so we have to calibrate those out. Uh, so the first calibration frames we take are called bias frames, uh, which are really, really, really short frames to capture just the read noise in the camera. And then we have dark frames, which are taken at the same length as the frames of the picture in, and they're there to um, remove all of the thermal noise from kind of the, the camera itself. Um, and finally, we have flat frames, which are taken against what we call a flat light source, but it's really a white t-shirt pointed at the sky. Um, and that, that looks at removing things like um, dimming of the image towards the edges, which is called vignetting, and also things like dust on the optics. And so once we've got all of these, and we try to take about 100 of each of, each of the bias darks and flats, and maybe 40 to 100 of, of, of the lights, which works out about two and a half to 10 hours of data, um, what we do is we stack all of the calibration frames. So we take like an average of all of the different calibration frames and that kind of removes any, any slight variations in that data. So we, have, we end up with a, what's called a master bias, a master dark and a master flat. And then what we do is we then take these master frames and we take our lights and we calibrate that. So what that results in is we, we subtract the bias and the dark signals from the light frames and we divide the flat frame by the light frames. And that results in removing any of the distortion of the light and removing any of the noise from the camera. And what we do is we take those calibrated light frames and we stack those, which effectively kind of takes an average of those. And then we also do a thing called drizzling, which is an algorithm developed by Hubble um, or for Hubble or whatever, which is where you sort of scale up the image two or three times and you interpolate the values in between the pixels and it results in a much smoother, kind of less pixelated image. Um, and then after that, ideally you have a picture. Unfortunately, there's a lot more post-processing to go after that to remove things like noise and a sky glow and to, to tidy it up a bit. But that's kind of the main process to get from our raw data to a usable picture. So to kind of demonstrate that, I've processed a, a few of the pictures we've got in the last couple of weeks. Um, so this is one of the, the first pictures we've got. This is M101, um, the Pinwheel Galaxy. Um, this one, these ones haven't been, uncalib haven't been calibrated. So these are only the light frames. And what you can see is if you look in the middle, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, do this laser pointer. If you look in the middle here, there's kind of a lot of distortion, and that's from the fact that we haven't calibrated these frames yet. Um, so there's lots of uh, it's not light pollution, but there's lots of distortion in how in how the image forms at the camera that we haven't calibrated out, and so this has been kind of post-processed out, and it's a bit noisy still. Um, so that's M101. This has been slightly processed, but it's, only, it's less than two hours of data, so it's not that great yet. We probably need to double that at least to get really sharp images. Uh, this one is from last week, this is M81 and M82. Uh, this one's actually pretty finished, uh, just under five hours of data. This has been calibrated, a um, little bit of corrections, and then we've just done a high dynamic range kind of process applied to that to kind of bring out some of the detail. And then at really short notice, I think it was Tuesday this week, uh, we got told that there was an ISS transit against the moon. And so we managed to take this with about half an hour set of notice. Um, it's a bit out of focus and it's a little bit overexposed because I just about had time to kind of get it all aligned and get the pointing right. Um, but that is in fact the space station going in front of the moon. It took about 0.6 seconds to travel in front of it. So we had to get that timing 
kind of dead on, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, and yeah, we, we've got it in GIF version as well. So, so any questions? Um, there's one question, how does the filter get rid of the light pollution? Okay, so basically the data that we want to try to capture from lots of astronomical objects is largely in three bands, and that's the hydrogen alpha band, oxygen three band, and sulfur two. Um, and kind of those are the three that are the really interesting uh, things to look at. Uh, the light pollution from, I mean, it, depend, it depends where you are and what kind of... Um, it's like street lights and stuff you have, but uh, that light is in a different spectrum band to the really interesting astronomical stuff. So the light pollution filters kind of pass that out, basically. They, they kind of block the areas of the spectrum where lots of the city lights are in, but they pass through all of the interesting stuff that we want to see. And the result of that is it kind of reduces that, that impact of that really bright glare in the atmosphere. And then you can kind of get through all of that extra signal from your actual data. So the second question is, assuming the hardware needs to be covered or moved in the event of bad weather and then will need to be set up properly again, how much of a challenge or time sink is it to set up the equatorial pointing before taking shots? So it's not too bad. Um, I've got it down to about 15 minutes to set up and take down now. Um, it can be difficult. It takes a lot of practice. Um, in an ideal world, you leave it somewhere semi-permanent so you can keep it covered and then you don't have to do all the alignment again. And kind of the benefit of that is you can get the alignment really, really close. Um, and that means you can take much, much longer um, frames without having to kind of stop because your polar alignment has limits, basically. As long, if it's not that close, you can get sort of long exposures, but not great. Um, so it can be really useful to keep it permanently set up. Um, but 15 minutes kind of either way isn't, isn't too bad. Um, so there are questions about the citizen science aspect, whether people will be able to remotely operate the telescope. Yes, so we're making it available for people to, at the moment, request their own data. Um, so we published a guide to kind of set up our automation software the same way we have and to be able to build up what's called a sequence, which is where you select different objects and you select different types of photos and you can kind of program all of that. And then we get a file shared with all that data and then we can kind of run that on the telescope. Um, it's quite a complex piece of hardware, so it's kind of difficult to work out how to do it in a, in a better way than that. Um, so that, that's the current plan at the moment. Um, we need some extra hardware to really do a lot of the scientific stuff so you can't do a lot of it with a DSLR because you need filters, but you can do it with a monochrome camera. So as soon as we have a like, admittedly really expensive monochrome camera, um, that we can start mounting up the filters and actually doing some proper science. Um, I think there's a lot of organizations doing things like follow-up studies on things like variable stars and exoplanet transit photometry. And that's kind of something that we really want to start looking at. So Emily asked, how would you recommend people getting involved in citizen science and are you looking for technical support in your projects? Um, so there's lots of different organizations that do citizen science. Um, things like Zooniverse have loads of different projects on that you can get involved in. Um, different organizations run their stuff in different ways. Um, things like the Variable Star organizations have loads of their own conferences and things you can get involved in. Um, and the same with the Exoplanet stuff. Um, in terms of a technical support bit, uh, we take what we can, we can get, really. Um, it, we kind of manage this sort of thing as, as, like, as like a hobby. Um, so it's, any support in something we're looking at is, is always appreciated. Yeah, it's worth saying that we had a talk a few months ago as well from the Cloud Capture System Science that's a RAL space one. So it's worth looking into that if you want to be a tester for that. Um, another question from Omar. For the master frames, do you use mean or uh, median averaging? So it varies a lot depending on what the type of frame is and how many you've got. Um, it's a bit more complex than I think just, just averaging. I think I've oversimplified that quite a bit. Um, there are several different interpolation techniques that are used and 
um, several different integration algorithms that you can pick from depending on, on what the type of data is and how many frames you've got. Um, I don't pretend to understand it all that well. It's a really big rabbit hole in the processing kind of thing. And it's taken several months to get the hardware running as well as it does. Um, so ask me again in a couple of months, maybe and I'll have a better answer than that. Um, Ashley says, have you looked into finding a better home for the telescopes than the middle of Didcot to remove the concern for light pollution? Uh, we have, and there, we, we decided basically that we would rather finish the full like observing hardware before we look to make it semi-permanent somewhere. Um, we're probably about halfway through that. So kind of the filters, the autofocus and the, the monochrome camera are probably about the same cost as the photos I showed you of the rest of the hardware. Um, so the idea is once we've finished that, then we'll be looking to set it up possibly somewhere in Wales, maybe in North Wales. Um, but it's kind of a, a problem that we've yet to really solve. Um, the next question, Stanley asks, uh, Raman is an insensitive technique, so what's the reason for attempting to do Raman spectroscopy, and what would the data tell you? I don't, I don't think there's any really particular reason that we've chosen Raman. Um, we happen to get the spectrometer from eBay for really cheap, is the best answer I can give you for that one. Um, we, we would like to be able to look at things like, uh, so we can do things like solar imaging, you can see certain um, drops in the spectrum lines. Um, there are, there are ways you can you can measure things in planetary bodies and things like that. And we a bit, we really just like to be able to see um, some of the absorption lines of the the, the more significant absorption lines. Really, um, that would be nice, but it's a bit of a long shot. We admit. So the next question is from Jeremy, which is: um, Is the DSLR shooting individual frames or continuous video? How many frames per second and at what resolution? So for planetary bodies, you take video. And the reason for that is they're very bright. Often they're moving. Things like Jupiter turn quite quickly in photography terms. Um, so you take video, which is very, very short um, exposure rates, and you stack like a 1,000 frames to create your image. Um, for deep space objects, you shoot individual frames. For instance, we shoot for the, the, um, for the Bode's galaxy pictures. These were 375 second frames. Um, and we took about 40 of them. Uh, for the pinwheel, these were uh, five minute frames and we took about 20 of them for that picture. Um, so yes, these are, these are quite faint. Bode, um, pinwheel in particular is really, really faint. Um, it's actually quite hard to get any data off this. So we need to probably need to kind of triple this amount of data to get any good pictures out of it. Um, but yes, the, the reason you need really good guiding and, and a really expensive kind of like precisely aligned mount is because you have to be able to take these really long um, duration shots and be able to guide like to within the accuracy of a pixel so you don't get any kind of streaking. Um, the next question is how rare was the event of the ISS transit? Um, the ISS transits aren't that rare. Um, they are rare for any one location. So we got really lucky in that the center of the transit line was about 50 meters from my front door. Um, and the band is kind of, I think, five kilometers wide, something like that. Um, so they're all over the place. And there's actually a website. If you look for ISS Transit Finder in Google, there's a website that will tell you where they are. Um, but I think we got super lucky to have one that didn't require me to, to drive anywhere and set up somewhere else. Um, the next question is from Tim, and it's, um, did you know how to do automated control of telescopes before you did this project? Uh, personally, no. We knew it was possible. Um, there are companies who do things like telescope farms, where they have sets of astrophotography, and you can kind of pay to set your own telescopes up and um, in the middle of a desert somewhere, for instance, and you, you kind of operate those autonomously. So we knew the techniques to do it were out there. Um, given we wanted to kind of be able to share this hardware with kind of the little community that we've kind of built around the flame trench. Um, it required a bit of a different approach. Um, we've kind of got that down with having people set up their own version of the software and build their own sequences. Um, but it's, it's been a bit of a learning process to get to like a system that works. And the final question is from Timothy, and it's, um, are you using 
consumer camera bodies for astrophotography? And have you modded any to remove IR filters from the body? Is there any benefit to doing this? Uh, so at the moment on the Newtonian, we're using just a, a stock Canon 60D DSLR. Um, you can mod them to remove the IR filters. Uh, that does help. It passes more of the hydrogen alpha band, which can, um, you get more vibrant pictures, basically. Um, we haven't done that on this one because I use the DSLR for other things as well, um, which is kind of why you want to go to monochrome as soon as possible, um, because then you can use kind of dedicated narrow band filters and, and you actually capture that that kind of band of the spectrum in, in one go by itself. You can get much better kind of quality data out from doing that. Cool. I think we've covered all the questions. I apologize if I missed anyone's questions, but I'm sure you can email Ben any questions you have or anything you think of later. Um, thanks for tuning in, everyone. It's great to see attendance has been really good this week as well. So I'm glad that people are taking time out of their Fridays to listen in. Um, get in touch if you'd like to give a, a talk in a future week. And otherwise, have a good weekend, everyone. And thanks again to Ben. Thank you very much.